Assalamualaikum. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen from different time zones. Uh, this is going to be a full uh, forum today with people participating from different countries uh, on the platform of MSTF and Comstech. Comstech uh, is a permanent standing committee for science and technology representing 57 member states. And uh, I have the honor of serving this uh, wonderful institution of OIC system as the coordinator general. I'm also extremely pleased that I'm introducing someone who is a fellow laureate and who has received a very prestigious uh, prize, Mustafa, peace be upon him, Science and Technology Award. Uh, I was also awarded uh, Mustafa Price last year, and that uh, brings us to the same community uh, whose humble contributions are recognized by a very prestigious award. Today's event is uh, extremely important because uh, this is a series of uh, lectures presented by some of the most prominent scientists and researchers uh, in the world. Uh, both within the OIC system and outside. And today's uh, speaker is uh, a very eminent uh, uh, scholar, a dear brother, Professor Dr. Sami Erol Kalinde, uh, who has received Mustafa Science and Technology Prize in 2017. Now, uh, I was extremely impressed from the contribution of uh, uh, Dr. Sami. I was also there when this uh, award was presented and I have uh, had the honor of meeting him only briefly, but I'm sure that this uh, uh, lecture would actually lay the foundation of uh, further collaboration between these two organizations and Professor Sami. Uh, Professor Sami Erol Galenbe is a member of the Science Academy of Turkey uh, and holds the Dennis uh, Geber Professorship in Electrical and Electronic Engineering in Imperial College London. He works in G networks, generalized uh, uh, queuing network or Glen Bay network named after his contribution. His nationality is Turkish and he has received numerous awards. Uh, he has uh, made tremendous contribution in the field of communication, science and technology and he has been the pioneer of research in the field of modeling and performance evaluation of computer system. Uh, Brother Sami Erol Galinbe is a Turkish computer scientist, electronic engineer, and applied mathematician, who is a member of the Science Academy and holds uh, many prestigious titles. Uh, he spent his childhood in Istanbul and Alexandria, Turkey, uh, Egypt, he graduated from Ankara College in 1962 and Middle East Technical University, which is also a member of Comstech Consortium of Excellence in Ankara in 1966, winning the KK Clark Research Award for work on partial flux switching magnetic memory systems. He continued at the Polytechnic University, now part of New York University, earning a master's degree and PhD uh, from the same institution on a sto uh, stochastic uh, automata with structural restriction. Then at uh, INRIEA Institute and the University of Paris, Orsay, uh, Professor Orol uh, invented diffusion approximation for computer performance, drive transmission schemes to optimize the throughput of random access communication that are the basis of well-known MAC protocol and established scheme for maximizing the reliability of databases. Uh, he's a very eminent uh, scientist by all definition. His contributions are not only uh, extremely important in the sphere of academics, but also in terms of application. And he has been certainly a, 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 a leading figure in the field of communication sciences. Uh, in the heart of ICD has been performing lots of uh, very interesting work and very, very proud to have him as a speaker in this uh, series of lectures by the most eminent scientists of the world. 
Let me say that uh, Dr. Gallenbe has founded ISCIS, International Symposium on Computer and Information Sciences, series of conferences that uh, in, since 1986 are held annually in Turkey, uh, USA and Europe to bring together Turkish computer scientists with their international counterpart. He currently works on the interaction between energy consumption and quality of services in ICT. And this is the primary theme of uh, his presentation. Without taking much of uh, your time, let me invite with great uh, pride, Professor Sami Errol Galenbe for his presentation. Over to you, brother. Uh, thank you very much for your very, very generous introduction, a very kind introduction. Uh, let me just see whether you are seeing my slides here. Yes, we can see your slides. Very good. So is this better? Yeah, you need to maximize this. Ah, this is better now. All right. All right. Uh, so um, uh, actually, um, from a uh, performance perspective, uh, looking at computer systems and networks uh, which surround us, OK, we all assume they work seamlessly and that they are there forever and uh, at all times and whenever we need them. But of course, it's not the case. <laughs> uh, they fail and their um, uh, response times can vary as we ourselves realize uh, when we use them. Uh, we get random effects that we cannot explain. And in fact, also uh, whoever is providing us the telecommunication services or the network services or the cloud services cannot explain why things are not working at a given instant of time. It's essentially because the only way really to explain what is happening in such very complex systems is through uh, probability models, stochastic models. Uh, why is that? Because any single computer has hundreds of simultaneous events taking place. By simultaneous, I don't mean they're taking place at the same sub nanosecond scale, but if you're looking at things from a millisecond or even the hundreds of millisecond scale within that time scale, there are uh, literally hundreds of different programs being executed on a single machine. Now, that's a single machine, but when you put many machines together, influencing each other uh, through networking, through communications, then you realize that, in fact, in that time scale, things which are influencing us in our usage of these systems, uh, there are actually literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of programs operating more or less independently, but communicating with each other, which are acting uh, in the system where we are trying to get some service. Uh, the result, as I was saying, is that indeed, uh, the way you have to look at these things is as stochastic systems. And um, you end up having uh, models where time uh, operates uh, if you wish continuously, which is certainly the case, because each machine, each computer, each network component will have a different time scale. In fact, might have a different clock, and not might, but definitely has a different clock. And uh, they're all operating on time, uh, but at the same time, at the same instance, you know, as they do that, uh, they are changing their level of request for resources. Uh, for which we are competing as well as individual users. We're just one of literally millions of events that are taking place in the universe of ICT. Uh, hence, uh, the need for probability models to explain what is going on and to optimize these, these systems. And during my lecture today, you'll see some of these things uh, coming out. Incidentally, uh, and I say this for our uh, uh, very distinguished uh, chair of this session, where I'm talking right now, Professor Chowdhury. Uh, uh, I have used some similar techniques that I developed in this field to model uh, chemical reactions. So I have a paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society where I try to show that the same kinds of techniques that I use uh, to model computer systems and networks and so on can of course, not identically, but can similarly uh, carry over through analogy, carry over 
to some of the very complex uh, chemical interactions that are taking place in large molecular systems. So it's, you know, science is not the same, but there are uniform principles, similar principles that cut across many different disciplines. Uh, and that is one example. Uh, the, um, uh, my affiliation currently, as you can see, is with the Institute of Theoretical and Applied Informatics of the Polish Academy of Sciences, and that's because, um, as you probably are aware, uh, the UK has left uh, the European Union, has gone out of the European Union, and the UK is not participating in the UK, uh, the European Union research projects uh, scheme. And since a lot of my work is supported by the European Union research, I now am based um, posterior to Brexit, when Brexit became official at the end of 2020. In 2020, I changed <laughs> affiliation and joined uh, the uh, Polish Academy of Sciences as a professor. I also have links to other institutions um, in France and also actually in China, because I'm an honorary professor at the University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. And I'm also involved with CNRS, an organization which several of you, I'm sure, know very well, uh, through two of its laboratories, I3S, which is in Nice, and the Demoivre Laboratory, which we founded actually in London as part of Imperial. So I'm glad to be here. And uh, my talk as we said, is about energy consumption by ICT. Uh, but my work currently, and sorry for the noise coming in through the window, uh, but my work currently covers uh, both this area and uh, cybersecurity. So I do a lot of work currently on different aspects of cybersecurity. Uh, having said this, uh, you might say, uh, well, uh, why do we worry about energy consumption by ICT? Well, obviously, uh, we worry about uh, energy consumption everywhere, right? Uh, we worry about energy consumption everywhere because whenever there are problems in the world, uh, they reflect on energy. And whenever uh, we have energy issues, they, can, they reflect on the rest of the world. That's one reason. Uh, but there's another reason, which is uh, quite simple. It's that uh, information technology, information and communication technology, is a physical system. Um, more a physical system than a chemical system. The manufacturing of information technology components has a lot of material science and chemistry in it, obviously. Uh, the operation of uh, information technology is related more to physics, um, nanotechnology, microelectronics, uh, various aspects of physics. And uh, this reality, this physical reality, influences uh, the energy consumption of the systems that we use. So this is one reason that we're interested in this. Another reason is societal. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, we're all now, today, right now, we're profiting, we're benefiting uh, from the fact that uh, information technology allows us to communicate across thousands, literally, or tens of thousands of miles. So we are uh, talking from Europe now to uh, Islamabad, to Karachi, to Iran, to different parts of the world. Um, going on here. I don't know, uh, I didn't check where all the participants are coming from, but we're talking across the world. And we're doing this, uh, as far as you and I are concerned, we're doing this instantaneously. Of course, it takes time. This is a physical system, it has its dynamics, uh, but we are feeling that, you know, at the human level, we're seeing these events in real time. So that's the wonderful part. Uh, uh, information technology has some no, not so wonderful parts because uh, the same effects that bring useful information, useful dialogue across the world also brings face, fact, uh, well, fake news. It brings malevolent diffusion of information. It brings propaganda. It brings all the rest. <laughs> so 
you know, it's good and bad. But in addition, it actually impacts the amount of energy that we consume in the world, and it impacts uh, the CO2 or other emissions that will, that are influencing global warming. So we have these aspects going on simultaneously, both the positives and the negatives, okay? And of course, you might say, well, uh, perhaps um, uh, what we're doing now is saving us some travel energy. Okay, that's, that's true. It's saving us some travel energy, but unknowingly, you and I, right now where we are, we are actually consuming megawatts of power, of electrical power, because we could not possibly operate this Zoom conversation right now if we didn't, didn't have in the background some very, very large data centers and, of course, the millions of routers and fiber optics lines, electronic, microelectronic fibers, digital, digital interfaces, uh, then, of course, the optical fibers and also the copper uh, connections. If we didn't have all of this and if there, this were not all powered by electricity, we could not possibly have this conversation either. Um, I'm, uh, I willingly put, uh, I'm part of one, one academy I belong to is an engineering academy specifically, and it's the French National Academy of Technologies. And they have a motto, which is kind of interesting and relates to this, and I'd just like to mention that. Uh, the motto of this academy is to get progress. To have progress, you must reason, you must think okay and use facts okay you must reason of, on facts but then you must propose uh, solutions which are based on this reasoning and which makes sense i mean that people will accept and that then the people will share in other words progress is achieved through facts and reasoning so as to make choices that people can understand agree to and share and many of these things that we deal with for instance in ict and um, energy consumption are related to this. For instance, let's take the example, I'm kind of beginning broadly because I discovered that I have a bit of time. So let's, I'm beginning a bit broadly. Think, think of the example of open science, okay? Um, now there's, everyone says open science is wonderful. Yes, it is wonderful. And what does it rely on? Well, it relies on data centers and it relies on computer networks. Right? Without those, we will not have open science, obviously. So something is published somewhere, and then, great, uh, everyone can read it. Wonderful. Uh, however, however, uh, we need large data centers for this. So actually, the cost is quite high, if you think about it, and you see the cost immediately, that a lot of open science publications, including in professional societies expect, expect you to pay a fee to put your material online. Well, why? Because it is that fee is actually reflects. I mean, there may be some profit somewhere for some of these organizations, if it's Springer or some other professional, if you sorry, a commercial publisher or uh, Elsevier, there's going to be their profit. But if you take the IEEE, which is officially a not-for-profit corporation, you see that the cost of putting up an article is of the order of $1,500. So the cost is there. And where does this cost go? It goes into the data centers. It goes into the networks. It goes into their energy consumption. All right? So message, there is no magic. And of course, when we, uh, the open science example also shows us some of the societal impact, you can say, well, I'll put it on my little server in my office. Okay, if you have a good web page, someone one may discover it. But if this website is not well publicized, you put it there, it's open, but no one knows about it, right? It takes a long time to get that information out. So, okay, so here's something which isn't that great. Another thing, of course, uh, a lot of people, uh, including scientists and including scientists in developed countries and even in more developed countries, they cannot afford the open science fees. Okay, so the only thing they can really do is just post it on their local web server. 
okay, that doesn't give them the full world access. So there are quite a few challenges associated with, with open science, and all of these are actually full in the subject of today's talk, ICT and its energy consumption and its data centers and its networks. Okay. So I think I've, I've kind of made my point, and uh, I'm sure there will be some questions about this. Just to let you know, we have agreed with the organizer that about halfway through my talk, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to be stopping and uh, pausing for questions and for a bit of a discussion. So why do we care about energy in ICT? Well, ICT has significant environmental impact, both good and bad including heat dissipation and, of course, energy consumption. Cost. Energy is costly to extract and to transport, so energy in ICT is a substantial part of the cost. Just to give you an idea, for a mobile phone operator, its energy costs are well, within, well beyond the profit margins. Its profit margins are inside its energy costs. So uh, the uh, energy has a real impact on uh, the uh, profitability uh, of, a, uh, of a mobile phone operator and on its ability to invest, to call upon investments and to uh, go and, and spread its means of communication and so on. Uh, energy extraction of whatever kind we use has significant environmental impact. Okay. And ICT production itself, if we're producing, manufacturing ICT equipment, it requires energy and has environmental impact. So all these points are important and have to be made. So what do we mean, uh, what do we mean by worldwide ICT architecture? Essentially, this is the picture that you see. On the one hand, you have uh, the mobile networks, which are supporting our communications. I, I, I suppose you see this slide. Uh, that's the slide uh, marked worldwide architecture. So we have a mobile networks and their ICT capabilities. Then we have uh, computer systems, which are sitting at the foot of these uh, mobile networks. Okay, that are offering us the wireless coverage that is so important to all of us. Uh, you have these um, computer systems which are wired and which are, you know, basically um, you have the base stations here, which are the wireless transmitters, which consume a lot of energy. And you also have uh, at the foot of all of these base stations and uh, wireless transmission capabilities, you have computers and small networks and then you have the connections of the internet on the right hand side of the slide which represents uh, the tens of millions of routers switches controllers interfaces and fiber lines okay so this is the physical reality that is subtending what we imagine everyone says all of this is virtual of course that's not true it's all very very physical Okay, and it, it consumes a tremendous amount of energy, not just to operate, but also to, uh, to um, manufacture. Now, let's look at what it is. Uh, when we look at numbers like these, which are global numbers, you know, overall numbers across the world, we cannot rely on numbers which are six months old or three months old. We have to go back in time uh, so the figures I'm giving you, which are reliable numbers, are from 2019. I skipped numbers from 2020 because 2020 and 21 are, if you wish, abnormal years. Abnormal in the sense that we have, a, uh, of course, a special situation across the world with COVID. People were not working. Um, industry was not perhaps manufacturing as much. Uh, probably people were not traveling as much and so on. So all these things affect uh, both energy and ICT usage. So I'm looking at the numbers from 2019, and it will be interesting to look at the numbers from 2022 to see how things have changed, etc. But 2020, 21 are special years. 
So this overall energy consumption in um, uh, 2019 was uh, uh, 23,500 terawatt hours, okay? Um, and um, we uh, have uh, approximately eight and a half percent of that, which was used for ICT, for information technology, was around eight to nine percent. Some people claim it's 10 percent, but I'm using numbers from the International Energy Agency, which are a bit more conservative, uh, and it's about eight to nine percent. Okay, so who are the culprits? Who are, who are uh, the bad guys uh, in this overall energy consumption? Data centers, uh, 200 terawatt hours, um, the network infrastructure and radio access network, uh, 250 terawatt hours, end users, what are end users? You on your laptop, you with your mobile phone, uh, you with your uh, server in the office, computer system in the office, you with your AI machine, uh, a processor that is doing machine learning in your laboratory, uh, these are the end users, okay? And there you have approximately 550 terawatt hours, and you see there, unsurprisingly, that the, um, uh, this is quite comparable. You have 450 terawatt hours for the infrastructure, and 550 terawatt hours for the end users. And then what do you see? Well, the factories that are making the ICT equipment, they consume basically as much as the amount of energy consumed for usage, okay? So you see this uh, balance between uh, manufacturing, okay, and uh, the aspect which is usage. So you have these two things happening at the same time, and the total of this is the 2,000 terawatt hours, which represent 8.5%. Now, the question, of course, is, is this a static situation, or is this something that is increasing? Let me just stop for a minute and make sure everyone is hearing me. Would one of the organizers please speak and confirm that you are hearing me? Yes, sir, we are able to hear you. Okay, very good, very good. Because sometimes on the Zoom things, I talk, and all of a sudden I discover that no one is hearing me anymore. So that's not very nice. Okay, so we're moving a little bit forward with these numbers. Now, all of this, okay, is not inclusive of everything. Uh, what I have given you is not inclusive of everything, and here is what is not inclusive, decommissioning. Decommissioning ICT equipment also requires a lot of energy, okay? Because uh, the, the computer equipment contains, for instance, gold uh, on uh, wiring. Uh, and these things have to be re-extracted. Copper, you try to re-extract. So there are a certain number of things in the equipment that are worth re-extracting and reusing. So the decommissioning process is not just a matter of crunching it all and throwing it away or burying it, in a, bur, uh, bur, burying it somewhere. It's a matter of actually reusing some of its contents. And this itself is both extremely polluting and extremely energy bores. And these numbers I give you do not include it because decommissioning, it's very hard to understand how much energy is consumed. Similarly, extraction of materials, rare earths, etc. This is a huge strategic issue, as you all know. Uh, manufacturing is a strategic issue. All the questions around Taiwan, for instance, are extremely related to this. Uh, strategic issues around Taiwan are very related to the manufacturing of ICT. And the extraction of rare earths materials, um, uh, many of the questions, for instance, around Xinjiang, uh, you may or not be aware of it, are related to the extraction of materials that go into computer systems, uh, rare earths. Uh, so the areas in the world which have the materials that go into the manufacture of computer systems have a tremendous strategic value. And as we know, um, we have to consider a four to five year equipment usage window. Now, a certain number of kind of 
um, uh, very uh, green-oriented corporations. I know some phone companies, for instance, some, you know, uh, phone, by phone company, I mean a mobile operator. Some of these operators, what they do is they recycle their equipment, not just by decommissioning it, but giving it to third parties so that they can use it, even if it's not the most modern equipment, they re repair it, uh, fix it, etc., etc., and then have other people use it or they donate it to uh, African countries and so on. So they do a lot of, some of them do a lot of this, but it's not quite common. And uh, so the decommissioning and extraction of materials is a huge issue um, uh, that we have to consider. And in a given year, and if you look at a piece of equipment in a given year, basically what you have is 20% of the energy associated with your equipment is related to its manufacture over the past time, okay? And 80% of the energy for your equipment is related to current usage, okay? Now, what's interesting is that this effect that I'm just talking to you is increasing. So this energy consumption by ICT, for ICT, is not static. It has been increasing. And there, you have to be very careful of the, if you wish, stories that uh, companies such as Google and others tell you. They tell you, oh, we are very, we're getting cleaner and cleaner and our uh, computers do many more operations per second than before and so on and so forth. Okay, maybe true. However, the energy consumption by ICT is actually steadily increasing. Okay, I gave you a number of 8.5%. Um, about a decade ago, it was of the order of 4%. So we have kind of doubled, and it's not more than doubled. Why? Because 8.5% of today's electricity consumption, and 10 years ago, it was 4% <laughs> or 5% of that time's energy consumption. So it's a relative increase, but it's also a much more important absolute increase in energy. And this really sets the stage, I mean, makes you understand how critical this question is. Um, let me now pause for briefly and start this pause by asking you a question. Let's see if anyone in the room or among the listeners in the room in the sense of the listeners, anyone can answer this question for me. Okay, here is my question to you. Suppose that um, uh, I look at um, a living being uh, that has a fairly large uh, computer system and network. Uh, I'm thinking of you and I, okay, you and I. Uh, let me ask you, how much energy does our brain use relative to the energy utilization of the body? Any response? Any answer? Any kind of conjecture or uh, hypothesis? Am I being heard? Can you? One of the listeners answer? responded at uh, two hundred percent. One of the participants responded at ninety percent. Uh, let's see. One participant said, "I'm trying to 90. see ninety percent in the brain." Yes. Uh, someone else said, okay, 200, so I should be looking at the responses. Okay, very good. Uh, no, it isn't actually. It is 20%. Uh, of course, it may vary. You know, if you're a sports person uh, running and so on, you may be, uh, the, the ratio may be a bit smaller, although when you run, your brain works a lot as well. But basically, it's about 20%. So 20% of the body's energy goes to the brain. Okay, that's kind of an interesting point because it tells you that uh, we will, uh, I mean, if you think of the world as a kind of an organic system, 
where you're going to ask yourself, well, what is the proportion of energy in the world that should be used up by computers? You might say, well, perhaps it's going to be 20%. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Okay, so 10% shows us 8% or 9% or 10% tells us simply that we are on the way and it's growing. We're on the way to more. Okay, so that's an important aspect. We are on the way to more. So, um, uh, are there any other questions that you might want to ask? Any questions from the audience at this point? Uh, I would like you to, I, I can't spend my time looking at the list of questions online. So whoever is moderating the talk, could you just uh, check if there are any questions coming from the floor? Yes, uh, there is a question. Are there any regulations to reduce energy consumption and costs like from biomass fuels for ICT also by IPCC? Uh, the uh, answer, are there any measures? Uh, the, there is one thing that is happening. Uh, there are no, the answer to your question is no. Okay, basically no. But what is happening is that uh, corporations uh, that have use a lot of IC, a lot of ICT. You take, you take the computer companies, Microsoft, uh, Google, and so on. They try to buy energy, which is uh, low carbon. Okay, uh, they try to buy low carbon energy. For instance, energy that's produced either by nuclear or through um, uh, sunlight, okay? So they try to use uh, uh, low CO2 energy, uh, but that is kind of a false, uh, it's not a very effective way to proceed, simply because uh, the energy that they are buying, they use, but the energy that they are not buying is necessarily used by someone else, okay? So the fact that they use quote unquote clean energy just means that the rest of it is being used by someone else. They're just shifting the usage of high CO2 energy. Uh, there's a funny example that you uh, will appreciate. As you may know, uh, Canada is one of the countries with the lowest uh, CO2 contact, uh, content in its own energy because it has a tremendous amount of hydroelectric. Okay. However, Canada uses it, its hydroelectric to extract shale, gas, and oil, which then it sells to other countries. Okay. So Canada inside itself, it's very clean, but its impact to the world is very dirty. <laughs> you see what I mean? So the fact that, you know, Google says, well, we, we actually buy, we try to ask the power companies to sell us clean energy just means that the same power company sells the other energy to someone else. It just uh, says, okay, you can have it for a slightly higher price. Uh, and they sell it to them. And then they turn to the others and say, well, this is what I have in my hands. And I, you're welcome to have it. So the, the, the effect, the net effect is not positive. So by and large to that question, the answer is no. Okay. So there are no means. You could uh, start, uh, there are some positive things, for instance, some uh, data centers try to use their cooling systems, because as you know, a data center uses energy not just to operate uh, the machines, uh, but also to cool the machines. Energy is used for both operating and for cooling. That's why a data center uses so much energy, so much electricity. So what they try to do sometimes is to use the water circuits that they use for cooling. They try to use them for heating homes or heating at least the building where they are. Uh, or, but this, of course, operates only in the winter. So <laughs> it's only useful really in the winter. So basically, uh, the, the question is, is, is wide open. Generally, honestly put, the answer is no. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I have a question uh, yeah, that please. as you have shown in the graph that how the energy consumption in different sectors is increasing. So how do you correlate the energy efficiency measures being taken across the years? Because as the technology is developing, the, the equipment itself is getting energy efficient. 
and using less energy? Uh, I, I agree that in some contexts it's getting more energy efficient. Okay, how? Well, they, they, uh, the, uh, all these companies tell you we are more efficient and you say why? Well, they tell you, well, now we transmit uh, so many more gigabytes for the same energy as before when we were transmitting 10% of that, okay? And then you all agree. But in effect, uh, for instance, 5G base stations uh, are very uh, are are using more power and hence more energy than 3G. Okay, simply because they are operating at higher rates. Although overall, overall, uh, they are transmitting more rates. So if you measure your efficiency as the amount of data that you transmit for a, per watt so much data per watt, it looks better. But if you look at the actual wattage consumed by this equipment, it's more. Okay, So this notion of energy efficiency is not presented to you in a fair manner. Uh, the reason why you have this constant increase in er energy consumption is that we are asking, for instance, uh, we want our uh, we we want to have Zoom. Okay, we have Zoom. What does that mean? We're transmitting video. It's not a good old simple telephone call anymore. It's much more data being transmitted for a Zoom call than for a good old telephone call. Okay? So we have increased the workload of all of the ICT equipment, even though each individual piece of equipment is more energy efficient. Okay, for instance, AI consumes a tremendous amount of energy in learning. The learning part of AI is hugely energivorous. There have been examples across the world where, for instance, in Kazakhstan, they installed a lot of Bitcoin mining machines, and these Bitcoin mining machines created an energy shortage, okay, an electricity shortage for normal consumers. So what we're seeing is that ICT is increasing overall its energy consumption, its share, and its mac not just its share of the energy consumption, but also its volume of energy consumption. This is increasing, and significantly. Okay, so in ten years, it's doubled. So that's one point you have to keep in mind. In less than 12 years, 10 years, it has doubled. Any other questions? No, sir, you can continue. I've checked the chat. There is no other question in the chat. Very good. Very good. So if one looks at uh, the, these numbers, okay, you can then map um, uh, energy consumption into um, in the middle of this of this current slide you're seeing uh, the different areas that I had mentioned okay so on the left hand side you see the PCs peripherals printers etc and that was the if I'm not mistaken it was the 550 number and on the right hand side was the infrastructure which was the 450 number and those numbers also map then into obviously uh, CO2 impact, a number of billion ton tons of CO2 with respect to this. Now, the mapping of electricity to uh, tons of CO2 is not easy because it depends, for instance, on the country, on the location, etc. Uh, let me ask you another question. Let's see, let's see if you can answer that. In Europe, which is the country that has the lowest CO2 impact per kilowatt hour. Sweden or Denmark? Either of them. Uh, someone said Denmark. Anything else? Sweden, Denmark. Any others? Well, let me answer that quickly. Uh, the answer is no. It's not true. It's neither Sweden nor Denmark. Uh, for a very simple reason, uh, 
if you try to use wind power, if you have wind power and you try to use wind power, you must also have um, energy flows. You must be able to uh, import energy, electricity, uh, in the periods where, when there is no wind. I mean, wind is not something that blows constantly at high speed. It's something that's on and off, okay? And uh, so, uh, unfortunately, the, well, so it's neither, <laughs> it's certainly not Denmark and it's certainly not Germany, it's France. Why? Because it's nuclear power, okay? It has absolutely the lowest, around 60, 70 um, uh, grams of CO2 per uh, kilowatt hour, uh, simply because it's majority, I mean, it has some hydroelectric, but it's majority, uh, majority uh, nuclear. Another interesting example, uh, is Romania. Now, Romania, no one would think about them, right? But Romania does a very, very smart thing. Um, it uses its nuclear power plants to pump water upstream uh, during the night. Uh, so the nuclear power plants pump water upstream from, they have several rivers going from the um, northwest of the country down to the southeast of the country and the southeast of the country uh, the rivers all end up in um, the black sea now a very strategic and important sea today it's kind of lots of things are happening in the current war between the ukraine and russia uh, along the uh, black sea but uh, romania has its uh, is essentially its its sea is is the black sea and it has rivers going in from the mountains, which are more in the northwest, uh, and going down into the Black Sea. And they use nuclear power to pump water upstream. You know, they just have tubes. They move them up to dams upstream. And then during the daytime, they operate the dams. Uh, the hydroelectric power uh, is, is, is moved up. I mean, it, it, it could, it, uh, more water goes through the dams. Uh, they use that to generate electricity. So they have a fairly low mix in their uh, electricity simply because they have this very clever thing of combining um, uh, nuclear and hydroelectric. So it's, it's kind of fun, all this. You know, it's kind of interesting things when you start looking at things carefully. But unfortunately, all those who claim that they're using wind, they need a backup. And the backup is the energy they import from countries, from neighboring countries, which have higher thermal, or which have um, nuclear power. And for instance, uh, France acts as a backup to Germany, which has stopped its nuclear energy production. And France gives it some uh, nuclear energy so that it backs up their, uh, their wind power that in the north, uh, northwest of Germany, there's wind power. Uh, they just have to back it up in some way. So all of this is kind of interesting. So I think I can move on to my next slide. Uh, now, uh, the question is then, you know, all of these things are how can we improve? And improving needs some thinking. Okay. Um, uh, it's not possible to improve things unless you get some data, some real scientific data. And you cannot improve this things unless you find um, some mathematically based, okay, scientifically and mathematically, scientific in the sense of it's consistent with data, you use data for this, and it ha then you have to use math and reasoning to get into uh, kind of some optimum policies, okay? Uh, so what can you, should first of all, measure the consumption. You should know about where this electricity consumption is occurring and how it is occurring. Uh, you should consider Optimum, we have just discovered from my presentation that about one half of all energy consumption for ICT is based on making this equipment, okay, making it. And of course, carrying it because, you know, if it's made in China and then it has to be used in the US or in Europe, well, that means that we have to carry all this stuff. And ships, uh, which carry a lot of our commerce with Asia, are between Asia and Europe, you know, the cars going back and forth, uh, Mercedes cars going to, to, to China, uh, machine tools going to China, uh, cars coming back from, uh, cheap cars coming from China, 
uh, computers coming from China. All of this is traveling on ships, largely on ships. Okay, And ships are extremely dirty in times of CO2 impact. So I have not even mentioned that part in my story, but clearly what one has to do is to think carefully about optimum replacement policies for equipment. Uh, when should you replace it? And what do you do with the old stuff? Okay, these are extremely important things, research areas, and which haven't been really studied. Okay, the third point is dynamic management of quality of service and energy. Okay, there is no point in running your equipment. Of course, you can say, well, my equipment goes to sleep. But as you will see in a few minutes, uh, taking your equipment to sleep and waking it up is actually very energy worse. <laughs> You'll be surprised, but it's true. So you have to kind of dynamically manage your energy and your quality of service so that you are, in some sense, operating at an optimum point. And I'll show you a little bit about that. And then I already man mentioned sleep, dynamic sleep. Uh, but dynamic sleep also comes with its cost. So it has to be looked at as well. Okay, so what I'm saying here is, if you wish, the research areas where we have to look at these things more carefully. Just one aside, uh, people talk a lot about the Internet of Things, you know, sensors. Uh, sensors are going to make our energy problem much, much worse because they're increasing massively the need for information processing, information storage. And uh, this is going to make things worse before they get any better. I interact quite regularly with Huawei, the very large, the, lar the world's largest uh, communication equipment manufacturer. Okay. And they tell me that the energy problem is the major problem of their customers. Okay. Their customers are those who build the internet who build, who uh, operate mobile networks. And they tell me that this is really the key, the key issue for them, the key economic and technical issue for their customers. Okay, so we're going to look at different things, uh, kind of scientific evidence and so on about, about uh, what can be done. Okay. So, okay, we're going to put our equipment to sleep. Well, unfortunately, uh, as you see from these curves, okay, these are the traffic on a weekly basis on a uh, data network. Okay, and it's data from, this is data from Vodafone, so a large uh, uh, mobile operator. Uh, what you see is that, uh, unfortunately, uh, the traffic goes up and down, okay, based on time of day. So um, during the daytime, it's high. At night, it drops down. At certain hours of the night, it drops down. Then it rises again, and so on. You see this. But unfortunately, um, it doesn't go to zero. And it doesn't go anywhere near zero. Okay? It just goes from peak to about 33% of the peak. So you're not going to solve your problem by putting a lot of equipment to sleep. That just won't work, because these systems are operating um, 24 hours a day. Uh, another thing is that uh, sleep modes are expensive. Okay, going to sleep is expensive. I had mentioned this. And in the middle of this uh, picture, uh, the mi middle of the slide, you have two curves. Okay, these are actual measurements that we have done on a router uh, and looking at its power consumption uh, when it was going to sleep below and when it was waking up above i'm sure you see these two curves in the middle a system resuming it's waking up b system hibernating it's going to sleep and you see what's happening actually is that as it goes to sleep it's operating at quasi maximum power for a significant amount of time and you see there 20 seconds of time and it's working like crazy. And when it's waking up, it's of the order of 50 seconds of time to wake up. 
so going to sleep and wake and, and going and waking up is very energy and the energy consumed is the integral it's the area under these curves is the total energy that was consumed during that time okay and and why is it so simply because our computers and systems have to save a lot of data before going to sleep and similarly they have to take this data and move it from the backup store backup memory systems which are the disks and so on towards the live part of, mem of memory which is the semiconductor memory they have to move it back and forth they have to save and save and re-establish and when you do saving and re-establishing uh, you are going to consume a lot of energy okay uh, power is not energy but the integral of power over time is energy uh, the same things i it would require me to explain things in a bit greater detail but the same things are shown on the uh, curves uh, that you have uh, uh, on the right and, and left on those pictures and you're seeing actually uh, that uh, you uh, have also these uh, power considerations which don't look good when you put things to sleep and the reason for that okay uh, the reason for that is that when you create uh, sleep modes and so on you are supposed to just sleep the computer talking to you they are going to send you much more data to you because they don't know that you're going to sleep. They're starting to say, well, I'm not giving me an answer. What's going on? And so on and so forth. So you have all of that going on. And so you're actually going to increase also uh, the traffic over the network as you're doing this. So uh, uh, it's not a simple solution. Oh, we can put them to sleep. Now, uh, more curves like this. And again, uh, you see uh, the uh, uh, curves here. Again, our experiments that we have done. Uh, because as I said, unless you have data, unless you experiment and measure, uh, you're not going to uh, actually have uh, real uh, information. Okay, you don't know what's going on. So on the left-hand side, you have um, uh, three curves which show show you so-called uh, quality of service metrics. Okay, so in the system, uh, what is being shown is you are turning on and off one of the routers in the system and as you do that the whole one of the routers in which system when the system is the network that you see on the right upper hand side corner of uh, the slide you see a network and you're turning one of the routers off and as you do that the whole network is influenced by this because they have to change paths they have to change everyone has to change the way they're sending things around and the, the delay is increasing substantially okay you're going to uh, you're increasing the delay by of the order of uh, 200 300 percent across the network is increasing the quality of service is decreasing similarly the next slide in the left hand side the one in the middle on the left hand side shows you the packet loss how the packets are being more and more lost and at the bottom, you have the effect on jitter, which is another uh, metric. But with jitter, you don't mind too much. Apparently, its effect is, is low. But what you see is delays are increasing, packet losses are increasing. Now, the problem with packet loss increases is that in the Internet, if a packet is lost, a packet is a set of data, uh, a small ensemble of data that you're sending from one point to the other. When the, when the packets are lost, the uh, Internet protocol um, makes sure that the packets are sent again which means that for a given packet if it's sent again you have consumed twice as much energy the first time and then the second time and if it's lost again and again even more so again these things are indicating that just putting things turning things off or put, uh, putting them to sleep is uh, setting them to sleep is not the solution you have to be more sophisticated so I'm now showing you a little bit of curves where from papers, you know, what I just showed you just a couple of minutes ago is from research that we did, papers that we did. And now I'm going to show you further results of this kind. And since another half hour has elapsed, uh, before I continue, I will pause again for a couple of minutes to see if there are any questions or remarks that people would like to make. 
So let me go through the chat first. Right. So we still have no questions in the chat, but we have requested the participants to type your questions in the chat so we can ask our uh, resource person. Okay, very good. So uh, then I will continue with my presentation. Um, so what we did was we said, let's look at specific systems. And one such system, uh, you remember at the beginning of my uh, talk, let me go back to one of the slides and tell you where I've picked this system from. Okay, uh, you see this slide, worldwide ICT architecture? Does everyone see it? Hello? Any answer? Does anyone hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay. So do you see this slide, which says worldwide ICT architecture? No, no the slide is, uh, the previous slide is uh, visible. So you don't see this one yet? Yes, we are just waiting for that. Okay, so I'll wait for a, excuse me. I'll, I'll wait for a minute so that you can see it. Worldwide ICT architecture. When you see it, say yes, please. Uh, this is the problem I was mentioning. When you change slides on a Zoom, because of the network delays, it takes quite a while before it shows. Uh, anyone sees this slide now? Worldwide ICT architecture? No? Still the old slide. Uh, the, what, the, what, what is the title of the old slide? Sleep mode is ex expensive and many packets are lost. Okay, so I have to, I'll just give up on that one and go back to that. Uh, can you see when you go to sleep, you lose packets slide in red? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you see, measure and optimize the edge? No. Not yet. Not yet. Oops. Or else, or else you can stop sharing and uh, reshare uh, the slides. Uh, Okay. Uh, can you see the slide measure and optimize the edge? Yes, now we can see that. Great. So this is the kind of architecture that would be sitting at the foot of one of the base stations used for 5G. Uh, because uh, the um, uh, applications running around these systems are, um, you know, people use WhatsApp, they uh, talk, they use video conferencing and so on you, on their mobile phones. Because of that, uh, you need a fast uh, set of computers sitting right next to the mobile base station. What I mean by the base station is the radio unit that is talking directly to your uh, mobile device, okay? So you have a fairly complex architecture which is there. And what we try to do, because this is something that is kind of being deployed now, uh, we measured these systems with respect to energy and respect to quality of service and try to see whether we could obtain uh, energy savings by clever, management of the system, okay? 
I'm going to the next slide. So we set up a special uh, experimental environment uh, to conduct the energy measurements. Okay. And you see, uh, you see the slide which says measuring energy consumption is non-trivial. No? Uh, who sees the slide? Could you say yes? Who does not see the slide? Say no. We are seeing the measuring energy efficiency in non-trivial. Good. Measuring energy consumption is non-trivial. Perfect. So on this slide, at the left-hand side, there's something called NUC. Uh, the NUC is the main processor, the main, if you wish, computer in this architecture. And we're trying to measure its energy consumption accurately uh, as a function of the work it is doing, of the traffic it is carrying. And we set up the apparatus that is described on the slide to obtain the measurement. Now I'm going to go to the next slide. And do you see the slide which says the NUCS energy consumption characteristics? Yes. OK. Now, what we see here is the um, instantaneous power on the left-hand side in watts uh, against its throughput in megabits. So you're going from, say, uh, 200 megabits to about 1 gigabit to a, a thousand megabits. So you're looking at its, uh, uh, it's being used as a way to, to, to the machine is being used as a way to manage the network. And uh, the, uh, its power consumption increases as a function of its workload, which is the amount of data. Now, in the middle of the slide, you, ha you have increase in energy used per load sorry, increment of energy used per load. So you have, <coughs> you're looking at joules per megabit. Uh, so you're looking at uh, how many joules that you use for each um, 1 million bits. And what you observe is uh, that, uh, of course, as the system uh, gets um, uh, more heavily loaded, uh, then uh, the amount, the same resource, the same machine is being shared among the higher load. So you have a sense that this is more efficient, but in fact, the amount of power consumed, it has increased. And if you multiply the power consumed by the time, then you see that the, that the total energy consumption, power times time, is an increasing function of the load. While if you look at per load unit, it looks better. Okay. Now, we also look here, as at this curve shows you another measurement, which is uh, the average response time from services over time. So you're looking at time elapsed, 200 seconds, 400 seconds, 600 seconds, 1,000 seconds elapsed over time. And you're seeing how the response time, what does response time mean? It means the time between the instant when you request a service and the instant when you receive an answer to the service and you see that this is first of all random which is what i had said because you know you have exactly the same uh workload run five different times each time it's more or less different okay uh, but not but you have certain kind of prevailing patterns so you have an example of some random process that is representing uh, the way uh, this system is responding to your requests. Okay. Now I will go to the next slide. Uh, and in, the, in this slide, we show the result of the control action we're taking. We have used reinforcement learning, uh, also known as Q-learning, which is a way of, it's a kind of a mathematically based uh, learning algorithm, which allows you to have an objective that you want to minimize, and you're managing the system dynamically 
so that you're always chasing the optimum. Okay, and what do you want to do? Uh, basically, you want to save on energy. Okay. Now, if you want to save on energy, uh, you look at the slide on the right of the slide and the right hand side curve. I'm referring to the slide which says adaptation with reinforcement learning. Do you see the slide? Hello? Anyone there? Yes, sir. Do you see the slide? Yes, sir. Adaptation we can see. with reinforcement. Yes, yes, sir. We can okay, see. Good. Good, good, good. So on the right hand side, you will see an orange colored curve, which says QoS optimization only. It means you're trying to optimize just the performance of the system. You want it to, to uh, give you good response time. And the blue line says energy plus QoS optimization. What you're say, saying there is, I'm willing to compromise between quality of service and energy consumption. And the uh, uh, y-axis okay, is the power consumed, instantaneous power consumed by the system as a whole. Because the system as a whole is many of these uh, machines interconnected and uh, serving the uh, particular uh, base station, radio access to the base station. And what you see is when you want, when you accept to do uh, energy and QS optimization, you're going to consume less energy. Okay. Uh, you see, of course, also that despite that, uh, when you have throughput increasing, uh, throughput means number of megabytes per second required by your clients, uh, even though you're trying to do the best as far as a compromise between quality of service and energy, your power consumption is actually increasing. The picture on the left-hand side shows you the price you have paid in terms of quality of service. Because with uh, when you do energy and quality of service optimization, your quality of service gives you higher response times in milliseconds. While if you just do quality of service optimization, so you're, then you're doing, uh, you know, just uh, you want the performance to be very good and you don't care about the energy. What you see here with these curves is that you can actually save of the order of 30, 40 percent of energy by compromising and accepting lower quality of service. OK, so uh, there is no magic. You gain by saving energy, but you lose by having reduced performance. Okay, and this is the point I wanted to make. These are real experiments on real equipment using a control algorithm, a system control algorithm, and we see that we are obtaining what we wanted. What we wanted is we want to save energy, and we want to uh, accept that the performance would drop, would not be as good. Okay, so we see that for with about a few percent drop in performance, uh, we can get 30 to 40 percent drop in energy consumption. So this is the kind of result we're looking for. Now, so far, I haven't really talked to you about wireless, but there are some very interesting questions around that, and I'll just mention them. Um, and uh, I'm now showing you the slide that says conventional problem, optimum power to minimize energy consumed for successfully received data packet. Can you see that? Hello? Yes, sir, we can see. Good. So what you're seeing here is a lot of uh, wireless units. They're talking to each other. And we'd like to see how we can optimize energy consumption. And that's very interesting, uh, uh, what is going on, because um, of a, again, an interesting trade-off. Okay. Um, where do we consume power in a wireless system? First of all, the um, 
processing units, the electronics uh, that is uh, operating, that is encoding the data, uh, is going to um, use uh, some um, power and hence energy. Uh, then the transmitting unit is going to also have that. But if you are storing uh, data, you're also going to be consuming energy for that. Okay, so the processing is like you encode, decode, and so on. Uh, the transmission is what you pump into your transmitter so that it can carry longer distances or so that uh, you will hear clearly uh, what is being received uh, if the transmitter has higher power. And then you have the effect of uh, the storage inside the transmitter. If you have a slower transmitter, slower effective transmitter, uh, the storage will consume more energy. Why is that? Because more packets will be stored for a longer amount of time. Simple reason. So you have all these effects, okay? On the one hand. On the other hand, uh, you have in wireless systems something called interference. Okay? Uh, what we call interference, not energy efficiency versus power, what we call interference is the effect of other people who are competing for us for the same wireless channel. Because many people are using the same, and many transmitters are using the same channel. It's like a lot of people shouting in the same room. And therefore, if there are a lot of people shouting in the same room, you will not hear as well what some individual that you are interested in is saying. Okay? So you have exactly that effect. And so this, uh, and of course, you also have channel noise. But interference depends on actually the transmitting power of the others. So you may have a high voice. Uh, people hear you have a powerful voice. But if some other people do just like you, they shout harder to be heard better, you will have exactly the effect of people actually stopping each other from understanding the conversation. Okay? I call this the American, um, American restaurant effect. In America, everyone starts shouting in restaurants. You know, they're all trying to talk to the people at the table where they are. They talk louder. And then, of course, the people at the neighboring tables hear them talking louder and cannot hear the people talking at their own table. So kind of it's a negative effect of this using more power to speak. And there is an optimum level of power for this, which will minimize your energy. So that's kind of interesting. And it's shown uh, on the little curve on the right-hand side. Uh, I'm show now showing you the slide which has identical users with n-bit packets. Can everyone see that? Yes, sir. Okay. So you see on the right-hand side at the bottom, you see a curve where the x-axis is uh, the uh, transmission power. Okay. And the y-axis is the total energy consumed. And what you see is that uh, or, or, uh, per, per, packet, per packet. And what you see is that there is some kind of optimum effect uh, where you're maximizing throughput. It's, 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 not, it's the effective transmission time of, of the packets. The effective transmission time, the throughput of, of, of the system is maximized at some power level and if you are above that, it makes things worse. And if you are below that, it makes things worse. So this gives you an idea of how you can optimize your uh, system, your transmission system, so that you can modulate, play with power to get the best uh, performance. And you shouldn't put too much and you shouldn't put too little, which is kind of a reassuring uh, type of result. Now, similar results, when you're uh, looking at servers, servers can be data centers, clouds, etc. Uh, so you should be seeing a slide now which says servers, simple composite cost for delay and energy. Uh, can you see that? Yes, sir. Okay. And down there you have a formula which has one part, which is the response time given using queuing theory and on the right hand side, you have the energy, you have response time for a job, and on the right-hand side, you have energy consumption for a job. 
And what you see uh, is that the optimum operating level uh, of a system is uh, uh, going to be, you should be, you can calculate it from the previous formula. You can get a closed form expression for the optimum operating level. And this optimum operating level is kind of, a, and on the bottom you see a parametric curve of that. This is, we'll go into the details. And then uh, let me go to uh, the following curve, which says theory versus experimental data. Can you see it? Yes, sir, we can see that. Okay. And what you're seeing here is the solid lines are theoretical results. And the green or black or blue dots are the measurements. Uh, so what you're seeing is that if you operate the system at a certain operating point, which we call rho, uh, which is actually the load on the system, you can operate it at a place where you get the optimum quality of service versus energy effect. So that's kind of an interesting result because it says there isn't any point in working, walking, working at the right hand side or the, or, or the left hand side of the optimum. You should try to stay there in the middle uh, so that you have a good balance between how much energy you use and how much quality of service you get. So these are the more, if you wish, technical scientific types of results that one gets. At this point, I would like to conclude, okay? Uh, all of the results that I have shown you are from some, some of my papers. Uh, what I can do, if it's okay with you, I can send you all of the references. Uh, no point in showing them, there are just too many. Uh, I'll send you all of the references and um, to Comsets uh, and to Golam at the uh, Mustafa Prize organization. I will send you all of the references and then anyone who asks, you can send them. If they want to see more papers, look at the details, etc. cetera, okay? Uh, the, the moral of the story, the message, is that ICT systems are complex and highly interconnected. Although individually, Components are more energy efficient. This is one of you, one of the questions was about that. Um, as these systems individually are more energy efficient, their complexity and their interconnectivity makes it they're actually consuming more energy. And of course, the presence of ICT is growing, and that's why we're having a Zoom call now rather than sending letters to each other through uh, the postal mail. Okay. Furthermore, new applications such as cryptocurrencies and blockchain and AI are highly energy vorous. For instance, it is estimated that Bitcoin consumes as much electricity as a small country which is highly developed, uh, the Netherlands, Holland. Okay? So it doesn't come free of charge. It comes with additional energy consumption. So, um, we realize that ICT consumes a significant portion of electricity and has significant environmental impact. Uh, understanding how we can balance quality of service and energy is a scientific problem that requires careful analysis and experimentation. Adaptive management can be used to reduce ICT energy consumption and environmental imp impact. So to improve environmental impact, you have to be clever. There aren't simple solutions. And thank you very much. I will stop there and then pause for questions. Thank you, sir, uh, for your wonderful presentation. I'll just skim through the chat if there is some questions. We would request all the participants, if you have any questions, you can write down in the chat. As we are waiting for questions in the chat, I'll ask, 
I'll share an event like uh, there was a news for Microsoft that uh, they submerged their data center in the sea to reduce the energy consumption. And that was very successful. And they aim for having more data centers to be submerged in the sea. So what do you, what do you want to say about that? Uh, well, that sounds like fun uh, going down into the sea. Of course, what they're trying to do is to simplify the cooling problem, right? Uh, so they want to make it easier to cool. But of course, um, if you think of manufacturing a data center that is submerged in the sea, you can wonder the uh, civil engineering difficulties that it creates. And then you can ask yourself how much more energy have they consumed in the civil engineering aspects just to make it happen in this way. You see what I mean? So, I mean, you can try all kinds of things and use them as publicity, but you have to do your calculations carefully. Let me give you an example of what I'm saying. About five years ago, Sweden, someone had mentioned Sweden. Sweden is one of the countries in the world that has the oldest installations in telephony. I mean, they started before everyone else build, building telephone systems. They are quite ahead. And in fact, a lot of the theory of telephone systems was developed by Swedish people, uh, famous names like Palm and so on. And they have the famous company Ericsson, as you all know. So uh, the, the Swedish had a very old infrastructure and they said, we will modernize it because we were going to save energy. And they did that. So they modernized the system. And now they have a system which is running with perhaps half of the energy consumption of the previous system. However, to go from the old system to the new system, what did they do? They were digging a lot of trenches, uh, breaking down a lot of buildings and putting up a lot of new buildings. Okay, So the investment in energy just to make the transition was absolutely huge. And that will take at least 10 years to amortize. So what I'm just saying is that people, when they make claims that they're doing this wonderful thing or that wonderful thing, they don't tell you all the energy they have consumed. They just tell you the end results. Now I have a data center inside the sea that needs fewer cool cooling. Okay, but how did you build all the external structure for this data center? How did you introduce it into the sea? How do you go to it? to make, do the maintenance? How do you come back from it to do uh, after the maintenance? And so on. all these questions, which are all energy consuming, are never truthfully addressed. Uh, have I answered your question? Yes, sir. Uh, we don't have any more questions in the chat. Should we wait for some or should we conclude? Uh, might want to conclude. So I would uh, thank you on behalf of Comstech and uh, MSTF for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, so what we can do with the participant is that we can share this presentation with all the participants, as, as you said, that uh, we can share the references as well, whosoever in, is interested in it. So we look forward to have you on other uh, lectures as well. And uh, we wish that you have, uh, you are, in Pakistan in December, and we would like to welcome you in Islamabad as well. So thank you for all. I hope, to, I hope to visit you indeed in Islamabad as well. You're most welcome, sir. Forward to that. And we thank all the participants for uh, uh, their <clears throat> interactive session for participating. We hope that we had more questions, uh, and I would request that if there are more questions, you can just write at haris at comstech.org you can send the questions in my mail and we'll request our uh, resource person we i guess we have a question uh, so we have a question thank you for your presentation professor i understand that not the manufacturers get keys for energy saving for instance in changing the design changing the design of things, but the users of internet providers 
we are quite stuck with the energy costing protocol and design of connected things unless we manage to balance the couple quality of services and energy cost it was uh, yes uh, now the, the um, there are in manufacturing there are two different aspects uh, there is the design of the chips, the design and the manufacturing of the chips, okay? The design and manufacturing of chips is something which uses a lot of energy because you do a lot of very precise, say, laser physics. You're doing etching and so on, all kinds of things which are highly energy consuming. Uh, I don't think that in that area there is real savings. Uh, the savings is in the energy efficiency of the equipment that we have, uh, which does more work individually for less power. Okay, so for instance, uh, we're doing one CPU operation with uh, less energy consumption. However, in all of our machines, we do more and more operations. Why is that? Because our applications are more complex. For instance, we use many, much more graphics. Uh, we use much more machine learning. Uh, we use much more numerical computation. We use much more simulation in everything that we do. Okay? Today, you don't do a civil engineering project, which in theory has nothing to do with computers. You don't do it without a lot of computer-aided design and simulation and modeling and so on. Okay? We don't do architecture without that. So we do a much more complicated, complex <coughs> computations than we used to do before. Because of that, our overall energy consumption is increasing. <coughs> and there is nothing we can do about that. As the amount of computation increases, and communication increases, our energy consumption from ICT increases both in proportion and in absolute value. What is the way forward? The way forward is indeed, as the question, uh, the person who raised the question said, is to cleverly balance the required quality of service against uh, the uh, energy consumption, to recognize that we have to trade off one thing against the other. Thank you for the question, yeah, which kind of uh, summarized the message of the talk. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we hope that all the questions from the participants have been answered. In case we still get any questions by email, we'll get back to you. Uh, and we'll uh, put these questions to Professor and uh, the responses will be sent back to the participants. So thank you once again, Professor, for your time and for a wonderful presentation. We hope to uh, have more lecture series from your side. And we also thank MSTF for uh, this joint activity with us. And we hope that we can have more activities with MSTF in future. And uh, I thank all the participants as well, uh, who have been participating from different countries of uh, the OIC world. And we look forward to have them on other events as well. Thank you, everyone. I mean, thank you for your interest and for your encouragement. Thank you very much. And just get the message that this is a scientific problem and that there is good research to be done about it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.